Okay guys, in this little video segment, we're going to talk about uh, the strength of an acid or a base and how we use that strength of acid and base in conjunction with some of the equilibrium stuff we talked about in our previous unit. So, first thing we need to do is talk about strength. Um, when it comes to acids and bases, we have some acids and some bases that we consider strong acids and strong bases. We give them the qualitative name of strong acid, strong base. Um, if you take a look, uh, these are all the strong acids and all the strong bases that you are going to find in a typical chemistry setup, okay, or a typical chemistry lab, or a typical chemist would know off the top of their heads. Um, you are going to be responsible for these. Now, at first glance, you might think, oh, wow, that's a lot of things to memorize, um, or is it a lot to, re to remember? But if you look at it, it really isn't as bad as you think it is. Um, if you look, your strong acids, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroidotic acids, um, those are a lot of your halogen-based acids. The only exception to that is hydrofluoric. It's actually a weak acid. Uh, so your halogen-based acids, uh, chlorates, nitrates, sulfates, um, a lot of those, again, are the polyatomic ions that we talked a lot about. Um, for our different acids. So while they are, you know, six of them to remember, uh, if you remember that typically your halogen-based acids and the ones from some of the polyatomic ions like sulfate and nitrate uh, and perchlorate, those kind of makes it a little bit easier for you. Now if you come over here, where the acids are kind of easy to, to get some trends on them, the bases are really easy in terms of the trends. So for a strong base, if you look, they're all hydroxides. So it's got to be a hydroxide to be a strong base. And what do you notice about lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium? You could put francium in here too. Uh, they just didn't do it because it's not very common. And then you have magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium. Um, you could put beryllium in here too, but again, it's not very common, so they don't put it in our list. But if you look, all hydroxides and all alkali metals and your alkaline earth metals okay so group one and group two so an easy way to remember all your bases is strong bases are hydroxide plus either group one or group two metals and I won't ever give you the exceptions if there's exceptions there so in terms of remembering you seem to remember that it's hydroxides plus an alkali metal or an alkaline earth metal uh, into that now one thing to note, um, as we take a look at our strong acids again, go back to that, we notice that sulfuric acid here um, is a diprotic acid, which means it has two protons to give up. And in relationship to those protons to give up, or those hydrogen ions, only the first one is considered strong. So it actually breaks apart in two separate steps, where it loses one hydrogen, and that one ionizes first, that one that leaves first is considered strong. It completely ionizes. The second hydrogen for it to leave, uh, it takes a little bit more to make that happen. So um, if we read the little sentence down here, two distinct steps, it's a strong acid only in the first ionization. Okay, See page 687, don't do that. That's from a different textbook, so don't worry about that for that you know, explanation. Okay, um, so keep in mind that this is only strong for the first hydrogen. So you might want to put a little jello note here that says that. If we take a look at strength, um, we've already talked about strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. And when it comes to acids and bases, we're doing the back, the, exactly the same thing. Strength is based on how well they ionize in water. Strong acids, we say completely ionize. Weak acids, only a small percentage ionize. So if we take a look at our... Uh, segment A and segment B over here. Um, here's your H pluses and A minuses floating around. Looks like there's one that's still hooked together in solution right here. Um, so if you look, the majority of these all ionized. So we could say that it completely ionizes. So we would consider this a strong acid. Down here, we see the H, which stands for the hydrogen, and A for the anion. So the hydrogen plus an anion for, for uh, an acid. Notice how most of them in this solution are grouped together. So if you assume this is dissolved in water, uh, most stay together, but you only have a couple here that split apart. So this would be our weak 
um, assets or bases. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could actually quantify this or actually put numbers too strong and weak? Well, if you remember from our last unit, we were able to quantify um, our equilibriums by KEQs. So we can do the exact same thing in this unit, but instead of calling it a KEQ, we call it KA. So it's the equilibrium constant for acids, or otherwise known as the acid disassociation constant, or basically how much of the acid disassociates or breaks apart in water. Okay, So the larger the Ka, the stronger the acid. Now if you take a look at our equilibrium expression for this, we say that the equilibrium constant is equal to your anion in solution, your H plus ions, divided by the original concentration of the acid. Okay, This is all at equilibrium, of course. So if you take a look, if this is your acid, the anion up here is your conjugate base from that. So you have your acid, you have your hydrogen ions, and you have your conjugate base. So the expression would be acid is a reactant. These are your two products of that disassociation. Okay. Now, one key thing to remember is if you do have a polyprotic acid, or basically that your hydrogen can break apart into more than one hydrogen. So, for example, we talked about on this slide that sulfuric acid actually can break apart into two separate ions. You're going to see a different Ka value for each hydrogen. So, the first hydrogen leaving has a Ka value, and the second hydrogen leaving would have a separate Ka value. So, you actually do it in pieces there. Okay, and we'll practice that in class. So this is just kind of the lecture part, and we'll do all the practice in class so you guys can see how that works a little bit more in class also. Okay, so here's some examples to show you, and then when we get to class, we'll write some out, and we'll do some practice in class. So here's sulfuric acid, um, where you have your H uh, SO4 minus. Now notice this is the second ionization. Okay, they don't show the first ionization because the first one is a strong acid, so it completely ionizes. If it completely ionizes, it doesn't really have a Ka value to it. So the first ionization, we wouldn't even do this for. The second ionization, um, you have your hydrogen sulfate ion, breaks apart into hydrogen ions and sulfate ions. So here's your hydrogen. This would be your conjugate base in this scenario. This is your acid. Here's its conjugate base. And if you write the expression up, you see we have H plus, SO2 minus here, and HSO4 on the bottom, and the Ka value is 2 times 10 to the negative 2. Hydrofluoric acid, same idea. This is the only halogen-based acid that is not strong, so we get 3.5 times 10 to the negative 4. And then acetic acid, again, you see the same pattern, and hydrocyanic acid, where you have your hydrogen plus your cyanide um, in there. Uh, this is the nasty stuff. Um, it's your, basically your cyanide poisoning. This is where you get it from, is hydrogen cyanide. Um, and here's your values. Now, if we take a look, Ka for this one is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 2, negative 4, negative 5, negative 10. So in terms of strength of the acids, the bigger this number, the closer we are to being product favored, right? So none of these are product favored, if you look. I mean, they're all less than 1. So the reactant sits on the reactant favored side. So when you dissolve the second ionization of sulfuric acid or the hydrogen sulfate ion, most of it stays together. When you dissolve hydrofluoric acid, most of it stays together. Um, but in comparing this one to this one, you'll notice that even though most of this stays together and most of this stays together, uh, some of it does break apart. So that's why we have a Ka value. But if you compare this number to that number, you know this number is bigger. So in the two, in this case, more of this hydrogen would break off and make this than in this relationship. And this number is actually bigger than this one, which tells you that more of this would break apart than this. And same idea down here. So when hydrogen cyanide dissolves in water, if you look at the number, 4.9 times 10 to the negative 10th, it's a tiny Ka value which tells you that almost all of it stays as HCN and very little actually separates into H plus or CN minus ions. So this one has very reactant favored, meaning that most of this stays together. Um, whereas this one, it's reactant favored, but it's pretty close 
to being um, of being a one there. So this would be the strongest of all the acids here. This would be the weakest of all the acids in here because the weaker the acid, the smaller this number. The stronger the acid, the bigger the Ka value. Okay. Okay, so let's now take uh, this idea and actually write up an equilibrium expression. So what we're going to do is we're going to use carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, and write the expression for the first ionization of carbonic acid, because it is a diprotic acid. So carbonic acid we know is H2CO3, and in solution, it's going to ionize to make hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. Okay. So notice how it doesn't drop both hydrogens, it's only one of the hydrogens. And it leaves the other hydrogen attached to make the hydrogen carbonate ion that actually has a charge to it. So that's our first protonation. So we write up the expression, that's going to be a Ka equals our products over our reactants. So we have our H plus ions concentration Our hydrogen carbonate ion as the conjugate base here, and of course the weak acid itself is the reactant here. Okay, so we know that in equilibrium we have some of this in solution, some of this in solution, and some of this stuck together it all in solution. So this is the first ionization. Okay, now to do the second ionization of this, what we do is we take this which is what's left over, or is that, that conjugate base, and then we ionize this next. So we leave this, and our second ionization would be your HCO3 minus, actually forming another H plus, and then CO3 two minus. Okay? And we can write the expression for this example. Okay? Notice how we're leaving this one alone, we're not trying to carry anything down into this one, we're rewriting it for the second ionization. So because this thing has two to start, the first one does this. Here's your separate expression. The second one, same idea. We'd have our H plus ions. We now have the carbonate ion. And then here our reactant is our hydrogen carbonate ion. In solution. Okay? Mathematically speaking, we cannot combine these two. Okay? So all you can do is talk about the Ka and concentrations of the first ionization and the Ka and concentrations of the second ionization. You keep them separate mathematically. Okay? So that's showing both ionizations for the carbonic acid example. Okay? Our next slide is going to be an example that you guys are going to work on. So we're going to stop right here and then tomorrow in class, when we come back to class, we're going to start writing these expressions and doing some practice with those in class tomorrow. Okay, guys, thank you.